Uh, well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ian Benson. First, I'd like to just draw your attention to a couple of other things. Uh, one is that Ian is speaking tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. at Augustana on state-imposed ethics and religious teaching. And then again, here in Edmonton on the same subject at the King's University College on Tuesday, the 6th of March, that's this coming Tuesday, at 11 a.m. And one other item I'll draw to your attention from our little leaflet, and that is next Monday, again at Augustana and Camrose, a mere hour from here, um, we have a young scholar from Yale University, Emily Johnson, who actually graduated from the U of A and went off to Yale to do uh, doctorate work for some odd reason. Never quite understood that, but uh, she is uh, working on a number of themes having to do with American politics and the evangelical world, and she is going to be talking about submission and the American presidency, tracing the prehistory of Michelle Bachman and Sarah Palin. Now, I know a number of you are personal supporters of, I see Don Carmichael back there has been one of the consultants for Michelle Bachman, and I know that Martin has consulted for Sarah Palin. So, uh, you can rest assured they will both be there. In any case, it's lovely to see you, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Benson. Uh, Ian is a man of uh, enormous talent. Uh, he actually is a male model for a motorcycle company in southern France. Um, he has, uh, he graduated from Queen's University. Now, I don't know if that has anything to do with the male modeling thing. I never did. We'll talk later. I'm sorry. <laughs> He graduated, uh, did his first degree in literature from Queen's University, and then did a degree in theology at St. Andrew's College in Scotland, where he also, needless to say, played golf at a very high level. <coughs> Ian then went to Cambridge and did, uh, did his degree in law at Cambridge. One of the things that... Um, I've admired about Ian is his capacity to think philosophically and legally, not a small matter, around these complex issues of a modern liberal democratic pluralistic society and issues of law and, and, and religion. Ian has spoken before the Supreme Court of Canada on numerous cases where law and, uh, or where the, where the religious, religious commitments of people and their institutions have, at least from the perspectives of some, seem to collide with what some consider civil values. So I think he's really on the forefront of thinking about how do we really have a pluralistic society instead of simply one which uh, pretends to be so. Uh, Ian has also been involved in the drafting of a constitution on religious liberty for South Africa. So he works in South Africa, is an extraordinary professor at a university in South Africa, and comes to us from uh, Paris. It's always difficult to know actually where he is, somewhere between South Africa, Paris, and Toronto. Uh, Ian is also uh, 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 is part of uh, Miller Thompson in uh, the, the large law firm in Toronto, primarily specializing on these issues of religion and uh, the Canadian Constitution. So I'm delighted you're here. Welcome. Please come. It's a great delight to be back here, and I'd like to thank David Goa and those 
here who are affiliated with the wonderful uh, Chester Ronning Center. Um, I think the work they do is very important, and I myself am honored to be involved in it as a research fellow there. So um, thanks very much for today. Uh, I come before you without baggage, literally. Uh, it's somewhere between Amsterdam <laughs> and Edmonton. So, and in it was my talk, uh, my comments, carefully rank ordered and thought through. And this gave me the, the lack of that paper. Any sensible traveler knows to put their speaking notes in their briefcase. Mine were in my luggage. So, anyway, give me the chance to start afresh this morning thinking about this topic of justice and religion. Not justice and law, we'll talk about that distinction in a minute, but justice and religion. Something I'm thrilled to talk about because, in fact, in my experience studying law in various places, I'm currently finishing my PhD at Witzwatersrand University in Johannesburg on the better late than never principle. Uh, on the thesis topic, uh, a framework for the reconciliation of competing rights claims involving the freedom of religion. And it's kind of an interesting way to do a doctorate after many, many years of practice as a lawyer because it's been, I found it really helpful to have the practical background against which to put the theoretical overlay. Um, and I think an observation that George Steiner, to whom I'm much beholden for so many things, made about uh, learning to ask the right questions and learning to see that uh, areas of failure in analysis are often extremely helpful in helping us to understand more deeply a subject. And he's in, in a book that I'm going to read a short passage from in a minute called Errata, An Examined Life, which he published in 1997. He says many really beautiful things absolutely beautiful things about um, literature, art, music, and the capacity and difficulty of human beings to fully appreciate uh, the richness and beauty that are in these categories of thought. When I studied law after literature, and I didn't do a degree in theology, I have to correct David's very generous introduction, I just studied theology long enough to realize I didn't want to do it in a more, for much longer. And when I interviewed at Cambridge, they said, why do you want to change from theology to law? And I, I was young, but I said, because I think a lot of the questions that religion used to be approached for answers are actually now being dealt with in law. And the two of them looked at each other, the two interviewers, and one of them said to me, Mr. Benson, you may find the subject matter rather drier than that. <laughs> and, that's uh, the understatement of my life, that, that exchange. Because in law practice, what I found was something I came across, a distinction I came across years later in the work of Alistair McIntyre, and that being the distinction between techna and telos. And he, uh, McIntyre attributes that distinction to really all disciplines, but I found it had particular bite in law, namely the telos of justice, the end of law, has effectively vanished in law studies. It's been replaced by the techniques of legal practice, essentially. And one's required to do courses in the basic practical questions of law that one would encounter in contract theory or tort theory or what have you. Leaving lawyers and the whole pursuit of law somewhat adrift in relation to what the whole business is about. Leaving law rather susceptible to the the driving paradigms of the day, be the economic or, or other. And I think McIntyre's point is very powerful for lawyers and goes some way to explain why so many lawyers are unhappy as people. They're rich, perhaps, but they're tense. I've been in large firms. By the way, everything I'm saying today uh, is uh, I, I, it's been recorded in several forms. Um, nothing I'm about to say reflects the viewpoints of any of the institutes or centers with which I'm affiliated, and in particular does not represent the viewpoint of Miller Thompson, LLP, Toronto, and other places across Canada. This is me speaking uh, for reasons that are already obvious and will become clearer. Uh, the separation of legal practice, of law from justice, parallels in some respects uh, the same kind of development in theology, the same kind of development in business, where the moral questions of the application of these theories, these areas of being, of study, are 
seem to have drifted off. One's left with a series of dried out, disconnected things. Now, John Henry Newman in the 19th century made many extraordinary insights, but one of them was about the nature of knowledge. He says that if you take out of the unicity of learning, the, the interconnection of disciplines, one discipline, if you cut it out, you're not left with a vacuum. He says something very interesting will happen. Other things will fill in for it. And it struck me that this is what's happened in so many areas of study, and in, certainly in law. If we don't ask the questions about justice, something will fill in the time we would have spent on that if we'd had a more holistic curriculum. Uh, so you end up with culturally uh, things that are not really suited to deal with problems that we face, trying to deal with those problems. So you face something like the Enron business collapse scandal, or any number of scandals in business, by trying to impose a course on values on MBA programs that are themselves massively not organized to any coherent interdisciplinary framework for functioning morally in a culture. So, all of this is background to the themes of, that I'd like to touch on today. Um, in such a, with such a learned, I mean this thing is called a philosopher's cafe, <laughs> you're all much better qualified in your disciplines to talk about anything I'm touching on than I am, with the exception of probably Supreme Court of Canada practice touching on religion and law, which isn't really what I wanted to talk about anyway, even though it's what David invited me to talk about. Because I don't get to talk about theology and law, because that was taken from me in my studies by virtue of how law was set up, and taken from me in my practice by virtue of how practice is set up, until very recently when, Mirabile Dictu, I got the chance to start working back again on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in relation to religious communities in debates against the state. Now, maybe that's where I'll start, is with the, the most recent decision just a week and a half ago, two weeks now, from the Supreme Court of Canada in a case called SLNJD um, in the Commission Scholaire de Quebec, um, more colloquially known as the Drummondville Parents case. It'll become a famous case in Canadian constitutional history. I was there uh, as an intervener for two national coalitions, one, the Canadian Council of Christian Charities, and two, um, the Canadian Catholic School Trustees Association, who retained me to argue about the nature of religion under the Canadian Constitution, and in particular, the relationship between parents and state authorities. Now, why were they concerned about that? Well, because those issues were potentially before the court in the Drummondville parents' case, and they wanted to make sure that their perspective was before the court, lest it, their, their, their oxen be gored in the general jurisprudential stampede. Uh, the decision, which took a very long time to come out, the case was argued in May 2011, but the decision just came down last week, is remarkably short. It's unanimous, no judges dissented. And it's very, very difficult. It's a difficult decision, not to understand. It's difficult to understand how they came to that decision, given how the case was argued in court. In a nutshell, what was at issue was the Quebec government's decision to have a mandatory course in both public schools and private schools on ethics and religious culture. This was some of the follow-through from the Taylor Bouchard Commission, some of you may be familiar with, which was said to have been triggered in part by a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada some years ago called Multani. That decision involved the wearing of a kirpan in public schools and whether uh, the Canadian Charter Freedom of Religion should protect the wearing of a kirpan by a Sikh student or not. Uh, that decision, Multani, based on it's uh, followed an earlier decision called Amsalem, dealing with prayer tents or sukkots on balconies of a condominium in Montreal. Those two cases, Amsalem dealing with the sukkots and Multani dealing with the kirpans, had set the framework for religion and law in Canada. Religion and justice. Don't, let's not lose sight of justice, but let's leave it out there for a minute because we're dealing now with positive law. Note how quickly, as a lawyer, I'm comfortable in the trenches on the minutiae of the law and religion conversation. 
The wider questions that really we need to discuss in order to deal with justice are not discussed in the courts on these religion cases. In fact, in Canada, our court is remarkably reticent about saying the kind of things that you will hear from judges like Justice L.B. Sachs from South Africa, who has written eloquently and deeply about the importance of religion to culture. I want to read a passage from one of his judgments in the year 2000, because there's nothing like it in Canada. There's not a single passage in a Canadian decision on religion that says anything like what I'm about to read. This point is so striking now that we've had the Charter since 1982 that I actually made it before the Supreme Court justices. And I read this passage, and I said to them, it is time now in Canadian jurisprudence for you to become more confident, to, for you to say positive things about the role of religion in Canadian culture. And you're not doing it to the great detriment of our common being as citizens. Why? Because there are a lot of citizens who are involved in religious projects who are threatened by jurisprudence. They don't see the court as their friend. They don't see human rights tribunals as part of a common spirit building towards religious inclusivity. They view it as a threat. That's not a good stance to be in relative to the major forms of uh, jurisprudence of the day in human rights and the Constitution. Nothing. Again, in yet another court decision, not a positive thing really said about religion. Or in that case, about the role of parents in relation to educating their own children. That's what the case was about. They avoided all of that. They did in, in what must have been an extraordinary bunch of horse trading amongst the judges to get a unanimous decision. They boiled the thing down to be one of the shortest decisions I can ever recall from them. And one that focused on what they called the paucity of the record. There wasn't enough evidence to show why the parents objected to the course. In the courtroom, not a, the judges didn't home in on that. They didn't pepper the counsel for the parents, who were well prepared to answer the question, with their concerns about the paucity of the record. Not at all. They, focused, they, they peppered the Quebec government lawyers with questions about how they could they could reject the parents' request for exemption. Over 2,000 parents went to the Quebec Minister of Education and said, we want our children exempted from this course because we feel it trivializes religion or is a de uh, strongly opposed to our religion by forcing our children to use textbooks that include um, and, uh, comparisons of God and gods to superheroes like Superman and Spider-Man. We believe you're treating our religion in a way that will defuse our children's understanding of religion, confuse them, and in fact lead them to think that religions are just like comic books. Now, remember the case I mentioned about Sukkots, the prayer balconies, and the Kirpans? The key thing for you to know about those is that the court, in dealing with whether they were going to grant the religious request for exemption, did not go inside the religious person's sincerity. They simply said, is there a sincere belief that the wearing of a kirpan is important for this person's religion as a Sikh? Is there a sincere belief that the Sukkots on the, prayer balcon on the balconies of the condominium in Montreal are important to that Jewish person's understanding? They rejected evidence from certain Jewish experts saying, you can have a communal Sukkot, because that wasn't relevant to the individual Jew. They rejected uh, evidence in the Multani case about the kirpan, from people saying Sikhs are not obliged to wear the kirpan. The court said, that's the wrong question. The question here is, that person wants to wear the kirpan. As the French say, par contre, when we get to the Drummondville parents' case, they want harm demonstrated by the parents. And the parents fail to demonstrate harm of exposure of their children to the course. Well, think about this. Is that not the same thing as saying, uh, if a parent says, this is, I believe this is going to cause my children harm spiritually, and the court says, prove it to us. The course is new. There hasn't been that much exposure. Experts that were interviewed out there didn't think it would be harmful. You have to prove us to us as parents that it's going to be harmful. How is that consistent with the Kirpan decision and the Sukkot decision? Isn't that reversing the test for uh, respect for religious belief? Isn't it saying... Why is it saying that you not, why do you have to prove harm in order to exempt children when your religious belief 
your sincerely held religious belief is that it's going to cause harm. Moreover, if the parent proves harm, hasn't the court effectively said, we'll cut your hand off first, then we'll determine if you're damaged? Because if you've proven harm, the child's already harmed. What kind of analysis is that for a case involving um, children in public education? Very strange, but that is the decision that just came down. Um, it follows these, the penultimate, uh, or the second, the most recent decision before that is called Hatterian Brethren. It's out of Alberta, involved photographs on driving licenses, heavily criticized by legal academics because of its failure to deal with alternative means of meeting the state's goal. In this case, the Hatterian, the, the Hutterites, rejected the photographs as being in breach of one of the commandments. The court had before it an argument that said the, the state's concern about identity and driver's license can be met in a less, in tr less destructive form by virtue of fingerprinting. We now have the technology for fingerprinting on driver's licenses. They can be tested. They can, that can be sufficient. Court ignored it. Now, why did the court ignore it? No one knows. Um, the court ignored what I would have thought was a more respectful approach in the Drummondville parents' case because the parents sought exemption from a course. Why didn't the court grant the exemption? Isn't it on the state to show the harm of the exemption rather than the parents to prove the harm on the children? What's going on in these two cases? I think there's a one-word answer. I think it's Islam. I think we are seeing the state strengthening the, the court, strengthening the power of the state authorities because down the road they fear that if they weaken state power, they may not have the tools to rope in problematic groups within their culture. That's just my own view. There's a second uh, argument in the Drummondville case, and that is that the court very much wants to be liked in Quebec. And with great respect to them, they, I think, gave an unusual interpretation um, because they did not want another furore within Quebec such as greeted their decision on the Kurpan in Maltani. There's been various academics writing about the fact that it was in <coughs> Quebec that there was a massive outcry against the Kurpan decision, not in the rest of Canada. Quebec has a particular response to religion that is different from any other Canadian province. Anyway, here's what um, Justice Albie Sachs said in a decision called Christian Education about, uh, and it's setting the context for our discussion on religion and uh, uh, justice and religion. Um, For many believers, their relationship with God or creation is central to all their activities. It concerns their capacity to relate in an intensely meaningful fashion to their sense of themselves, their community, and their universe. For millions in all walks of life, religion provides support and nurture and a framework for individual and social stability and growth. Religious belief has the capacity to awaken concepts of self-worth and human dignity which form the cornerstone of human rights. It affects the believer's view of society and founds the distinction between right and wrong. The closest we've come to anything like that in Canada is the very bland statement on the essence of the freedom of religion from Chief Justice Dixon in one of the early cases called Big M Drug Mart, where he spoke there about the essence of the freedom of religion being the uh, not just the right to have a religion, but the right to declare it openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal, and the right to manifest religious belief by worship and practice or by teaching and dissemination. Nothing in Justice Dixon's uh, judgment about the importance of religion to culture in terms of its communitarian dimension. That's completely missing from Canadian jurisprudence um, with respect to religion. With respect to Aboriginal rights, there's been discussion about the community and, and the right of association, and that's important. But 
by and large, there's this strange lacuna in Canadian jurisprudence about religion, and I think it's quite fascinating because we pride ourselves on being diverse, <coughs> pluralistic, and open, and yet in our religion jurisprudence, I think it's often anything but. Um, I, so that's what, what I wanted to put on the table for background on the legal decision, but in closing, I'd like to just offer a few things, a few thoughts about uh, justice and, and its related concept, law, and then religion. Because I don't know if you've actually had a go at defining religion in any of your cafes, have you? Law hasn't generally defined religion. It's stayed away from it. It recognizes that it's a very difficult thing. So what it tends to do is um, describe why the courts are not the place to get into doctrinal disputes and dogmatic determinations, because they're not suited for it. It's too complicated. It's not really their proper expertise. I think that's probably in many ways wise. Um, but justice comes, we get that from the Latin meaning upright or just, and it's generally understood to mean the exercise of authority in vindication of right by assigning rewards or punishment. However, it's important to remember it's also one of the four cardinal virtues, along with wisdom, moderation, and courage. And in the tradition of the virtues, you'll recall that the cardinal virtues, the four cardinal virtues, are, are said to have been perfected by the th theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Um, and that's interesting, because that tradition of virtue seems to have become as thin on the ground as, as the general discussion of telos. And what we've often replaced virtue with is this language of values, which is very complicated in the sense that it's uh, deeply ambiguous. It could be argued that everything's ambiguous, but then that's in the nature of definitions. But uh, there is something particularly interesting about the place that values language occupies in moral discourse, I think, and the fact that the judges are quite happy using the phrase charter values all the time to discuss uh, the Canadian Constitution. Um, religion, the def general definition would be a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. It comes, it's said to come from the term legare, to bind. Um, I wanted to just read a lovely little passage from that you'll know from one of Shakespeare's many, many evaluations of justice. Uh, one of the various themes that he was uh, often commenting on in various plays, most profoundly, I suppose, in The Merchant of Venice is justice. And I wanted to close with this wonderful. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings, but mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. Now, just quickly to close, I thought of three things this morning. One, Sinai, Moses re receiving the Ten Commandments as laws, literally written in stone, uh, has its parallel in the central judicial or justicial dimension of the Passion. Jesus is on trial, both before the religious figure in Herod, and the state figure in Pilate. There's a jury who cries for Barabbas, and there's a judgment rendered, and again, mercy requested of the divine lawgiver by the sacrificial lamb. 
In Islam, the angel brings Sharia to the Prophet from Allah. These great traditions having this relation between justice and law in its imminent and transcendental dimensions point us, I think, to the inevitab inevitability of a relationship between imminence and transcendence when we talk <coughs> about law. And one of the things that's often struck me about uh, the practice of law is the theological aspects of a courtroom, the swearing of oaths, the, um, the need in a sense, even for contemporary liberal jurisprudence, to have itself rooted in something beyond the times, something that's binding on conscience. Um, I find these things very interesting. It's clear that they, they're rooted, as uh, René Girard points out to us, deeply within human anthropology generally. Within all human communities, there seems to be this um, quest for justice through law in relation to sacrifice and the divine. Um, I was going to read a passage from George Steiner, but I think I won't just point you to that amazing book of Atta and his own uh, luminous reflections on, on uh, the difficulty of appreciating beauty in a world that longs for justice, but so often, and often through religious forms, affects its opposite. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, as you recall, our normal process is to um, invite someone to speak to the theme, the issue, to pull up uh, what they would like to reflect on and put on the table, and then uh, to invite others who want to add to that, to put things on the table, and then in a little while, we'll ask for a new, a new avenue of exploration. So, so the first. The first person who would like to um, raise something here. We have Cambridge speaking to Cambridge. <laughs> well, close to your uh, mouth. Knowing only what you just told us about the Supreme Court, you've given us a picture of a court that, that, that's moved in one direction and then moved in the opposite direction. Can you not hear it? Well, in a minute. Start again. Uh, you've given us a picture of the Supreme Court of Canada moving in two opposite directions, uh, moving in one way in a, an initial group of cases, moving in, in the opposite direction in, in a second group of cases. Uh, is there any way that the court can dig itself out of the hole of contradiction that it's digging itself into? Um, yeah, I don't think I need the microphone. Uh, yeah. The question is, it has the Supreme yeah, and Court. Yeah, you need to speak from do there. I, do you I need to speak close to the microphone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 The question was, it has the Supreme Court of Canada painted itself into a corner or dug itself a hole by having adopting different um, strands of jurisprudence. I mean, courts are always doing this. The development of precedent always requires them to make nuanced distinctions from earlier decisions. <coughs> The difference here seems to me that they've got, uh, for some reason, I think they're being, they're responding to a cultural pushback in a way that's showing a certain reticence and timidity that I don't think is, help, is going to be helpful at all. Can they get out of it? Yes, but it'll require them to probably take some bit of a beating, I think, from academics, from other lawyers, from other cases to show that this approach won't work. And I think giving the state untrammeled power with respect to a course on religion and ethics, asking this, the parents to prove harm to their children, is not the earmark of proper respect for the parental role of, of uh, delegation of their authority to state powers, which has been the old law. A case called Audet years ago said, public authorities are the delegated 
in a sense, trustees of the parent's decision to educate. There's no preemptive power in the state to educate. It's the parents who delegate that to the state. I think if we forget that priority, we're in trouble. Because it's been an earmark of illiberal, illiberal regimes from time immemorial, the attack on, on the family and subsidiary structures. Want to respond? No, I think that's a good answer. Does this work? Ian, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. All right, thank you. You want to be called Ian or Mr. Ben? Yeah, Ian's fine. All right. I'm sympathetic to some of the general concerns you raised, but... Thanks. But on the... I, I have a lot of difficulty with the case. And particularly on... I, I'm interested in the justice issues, not in the legal issues. So I'm not at all interested in whether the Supreme Court contradicted itself, for me that would just show some possible sense, uh, or willingness to show sense. What I'd like to know is, though, about the case. Are you, for you it seems to be irrelevant whether there was harm, or would be harm, to actual religious profession. Well, so what's the basis for the objection? I mean, I can, I can see that if if children or members of a particular faith would be harmed by a course, then we have something to talk about. And I could imagine that there might be other bases for talk, but I don't know what those bases are in this case. All the, I mean, so, uh, I'm not criticizing your presentation because you only had so much time, but would you be willing to go into that? And I, let me say, the reason I phrase that is because, like, I'm interested in the general issue of religion in a pluralist society where we have different religious perspectives and we want to bring them into public life. But we have to bring them in, I think, bring them into public life in a way that accommodates the fact of the pluralism. So my interest in this then is, is your, is your concern with the case just the fact that the parents objected to the content of the course, or is there something more specific that provides grounds for objection? Yeah. Oh, that's an extremely well put and important question. The, the concern I have, I had to think this through very carefully, because one thing you have to do before you stand in front of those nine peering faces at the Supreme Court of Canada is you have to try and anticipate their arguments. And I anticipated that would be a key question. And the conclusion I came to is that there are many types of objections that parents may have to matters in the curriculum that outside of those parents are nonsensical or just silly. For example, uh, you can think of lots of examples. One would be a parent objecting to their child doing nude uh, life modeling drawings in an art class because it goes against their particular morals. Others may not have that objection. Family life courses in which they object to the teaching about sexuality generally, or abortion in particular, these kind of things. Ought parents to have the capacity to withdraw their children from these kind of things? Um, I think the answer is yes. I don't see that diminishing the scope for dissent or, a so, or, or rejection of a standard viewpoint is a bad thing culturally. In fact, I see its reverse as the real danger. If you start to say <coughs> there is no place for exemption requests for parents, everybody has to do the same course and this is the subject matter, I see real concerns there. Now, interestingly, in Quebec, there's a strong suggestion, and I've heard from several advocates in Quebec, that they are going to make this course on ethics and religious culture mandatory for home education. <coughs> now. Would we be concerned about a state, a provincial education authority that required that all children be introduced to a course on anything that n no family can remove its children from or refuse to teach? I think the answer is we should be concerned about that power. We should always allow the scope, allow the scope of exemption. Why? But, but, but that wasn't my question. I think it was implied in your question. So, well, okay, so I think your answer to be that the, the, the simple fact 
of a parental objection without providing any grounds of any further time should be sufficient to, to exempt the kid from that part of the curriculum? Well, no, because there is a test, remember. In the in the in both the Kirpan case and the prayer, prayer tent case, I mentioned the test of sincerity. There has to be a sincerity test, but there can't be a content test. Right? Yes, okay. okay. No, but otherwise, I mean, it's a sincere... Person says I'm sincere, and they don't disqualify themselves. That in itself is sufficient. So let me just ask you: Would the same thing apply to teaching on mathematics or teaching on history? Yeah, that was a, a, another thing we thought about in our court preparation, and we decided that um, there are certain subject matters, the content of which doesn't admit. To any, on any kind of reasonable basis at all, doesn't admit of that kind of parsing. So you couldn't say, we're against geometry, but we're in favor of calculus. In the same way that when religious ex arguments were used against seatbelt laws, the judges threw them out on the basis that they were just beyond the possible claim of a what I guess we could call a, a properly sincere belief. Um, that was an, an actual case in British Columbia where somebody used as a defense to a seat belt, not wearing a seat belt charge, that his religion was libertarianism and seat belts were constricting. The court said no. So I don't think I'm arguing for complete carte blanche for exemption from everything on the basis of religion. I'm not. But I do think with respect to morally questionable or religiously... Um, ethically difficult areas in a more social science area, philosophy, where there's disputed views on sexuality, on ethics, and so forth. I think there we have to be more tolerant of exemption than we would in a maths course. I'm, can I ask one more? Mm -hmm. I had said to David, I, I don't want to be in the position of debating from the back row. I'm really trying to force out some more specifics on the question of justice mm. in a borderless society. So I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to follow up if you if you can. Mm. But it's un, I recognize it's unfair. I'm going to ask you a question I don't would want to try to take on myself. That's which is, with some, I'm a philosopher, so I have a lot of sympathy with what you're saying. Of course, there are differences between uh, religious profession and geometry. No question about it. The difficulty is, though, to move from the fact that there are some differences to that there are differences we should worry about. And the concern, I, for some of us anyway, or the concern for me anyway, is to, to see what link there is between a, a state-provided course on ethics and of any violation of the potential for genuine spirituality. And uh, that seemed to me to be the ground of the concern. And I, I, get, I, don't, I don't see how, even for example, if they were to use abortion, you know, a very problematic subject, of course, or a very problematic issue, but even if they were to use abortion, I don't see how that's, so long as it's clear and it's public, and it's uh, by way of presentation of points of view that that violates anyone's either anyone's religious faith or more importantly their their opportunities to cultivate genuine spirituality. So, you know, could you say more about what that problematic is? Yeah. Well, again, you're asking you know this the coal face seam questions. I think these are, these are precisely the questions of distinction and nuance that are going to have to become more developed as these cases go along. But we're not, this isn't entirely new ground. For example, the courts have for some time made a distinction between religion courses that are acceptable and that are unacceptable in public education. The ones that are unacceptable are those that indoctrinate or, or are dogmatic. And they've made a distinction between those kind of dogmatic and impermissible courses from those courses that teach about religion and are not seen to be indoctrination. The difficulty in the Drummondville parents' case was that according to the parents' religious beliefs, they didn't object to their children being 
show, uh, um, exposed to Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Wicca, anything, as long as it was clear what it taught. The parents objected to the macaronic or synthetic approach the Quebec government had chosen in which it was required that all religions be taught at once and that they all be taught across a spectrum that must include myths, legends, fairy tales, and superheroes. Okay? They found that failure to properly teach the subject matter deeply offensive religiously. So as parents, the primary educators of the children, they said, no, we don't think religion, which we believe very, is very important to our children, should be taught like that. To such an extent, we believe the way you've structured the program attacks our beliefs at their core. So that distinction by the parents was completely obviated in the court's analysis, who simply, they said, prove harm. The parents are saying, you don't get it. It's evident to us. Now, interestingly, in the courtroom, some questioning of the Quebec Council for the Quebec uh, Commission Scolaire from the judges was, who are you to say the parents, uh, their analysis is not correct? And the answer from the lawyer was, well, their analysis is wrong. And the judge said, well, the parents are saying your course is relativistic. And the, and the lawyer for Quebec said, it's not relativistic. And I was sitting there thinking, this is fascinating. But one arguing it's not relativistic, the other arguing it is. Who's going to decide that one in a world in which the judiciary has said in other cases it's not their place to get into metaphysics? And the answer should have been, I think the right decision would have been for the court to have enucleated some of these distinctions that you're raising in your question about the kinds of objections the court will deal with with respect to curriculum based on the previous one I mentioned about teaching about religion and teaching religion and then bringing in as an important principle to maintain and even enforce the importance of the role of parents in education. They didn't do any of this. Now, it may be, and this is purely speculation, that the reason they didn't do that is because there's another case in the pipeline called Loyola College. Ah, Jesuits. Now, in Loyola, the Jesuits, in a Jesuit high school that receives a certain amount of funding from the government, were ordered to teach the same course, and they sued. They said, we're not teaching that course. We already teach a course on comparative religion. It's rigorous, does everything the state wants to do, but it does it our way. They sued, and they won. The judge said, I'm looking at these arguments from Loyola, and I'm pretty convinced they're already meeting the subject goals. So you lose, state. They appeal to the Quebec Court of Appeal, and the Quebec Court of Appeal has been sitting waiting for the Supreme Court of Canada on the parents' case. Now the parents' case has come down. I suspect the Court of Appeal will now have its hearing and argument, and then I suspect that one will go to the Supremes. And I think framed perhaps better, because there you have a real clash between competing worldviews, rigorously expressed. So perhaps the deficit they saw on the record in the Drummondville case they were already thinking may not be present in their case, but this is entirely speculation on my part. So, would somebody else like to pick up on? Is this Martin oh, the same? Yeah. I wonder. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm um, a little dubious about this uh, idea that. Uh, State needs to give in the parents as much as you claim. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Just, yeah, just some things close. matter. Yeah. 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 Is that is that coming That's across great. now? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm a little dubious about um, the state having to give in to parents um, as much as you seem to think. Um, the the type of cases that I'm thinking of are cases in which uh, evolution is taught in biology courses, and uh, in the states, of course, this has led to uh, a lot of controversy. Um, a lot of parents, I think, do sincerely think that evolution, I mean, I even just supposing that um, the, the life forms have evolved out of each other, not even bringing in natural selection, um, that that is contrary to their uh, religious beliefs. And uh, I think they're perfectly sincere in that. Um, but. Um, since the, the theory of evolution in that, uh, in that very general form is absolutely basic to the science of biology today, um, 
I would be opposed to the state giving into these parents. Um, uh, it seems to me that in doing that, they're giving into ignorance and they're depriving children of, of knowledge which they really need. Yeah, I mean, that's a common argument that the teaching of evolution and biology uh, is essential. And there, But the more interesting way of approaching that is, should other alternatives to evolution or other qu approaches to the teaching of uh, to the um, approach to biology also be taught? And in the stage, there's been a lot of litigation about intelligent design courses and whether those should be taught or not. We've had that in Canada as well. And there's a guy in Alberta, Dennis Lemmeru, who came up with a very interesting concept, which was he called teaching the controversies. Um, and I think that's a very good approach, where, where you'd show what's at issue in the evolution versus creation, intelligent design debate, with a view to getting the kids to understand the nature of the debates, rather than have a kind of dogmatic scientism, which is sometimes what was going on. I mean, the, the best scientists, I, I remember hearing Fred Hoyle arguing about the the problems of evolutionary probability at Cambridge. He gave a packed lecture there in which he said, come on, folks, you're not being honest to your science here. He says he was saying to the biology faculty at Cambridge, you're accepting levels of probability with respect to evolutionary theory that we're now debunking. We're showing you that this, this is, does not make sense. So you're being dogmatically scientistic rather than appropriately scientific. Now that is news. That's the kind of thing, that, but people get very upset about this because they've invested so much in the science in terms of God that they've, the, the jurisdictional questions of science and theology are being obviated in the analysis. And I think the, the bigger question is not whether parents should be entitled to have their kids exempted from a particular teaching about evolution, but whether the parents should be entitled to or allowed to have other speakers in or have some way of contesting what might be an increasingly dogmatic form of evolutionary education. And I'd rather see that. I, I agree with Dennis Lammer who teach the controversies, but don't, but don't give in to dogmatic, atheistic scientism. Uh, I don't think that's the, uh, the issue, really. Um, because uh, the kind of teaching of evolution that I'm considering is um, not at all scientism. You get into scientism, whatever that is, when you get into some reductionist kind of metaphysics. Um, and um, as, I, as I was saying, the, the teaching of evolution can be done without um, claiming that uh, natural selection is the sole uh, method that, uh, that uh, promotes evolution and determines its course. Um, and uh, I agree with uh, when you start talking about natural selection, uh, then you should talk about uh, the controversy which, which surrounds it. But uh, with regard merely to the development of life over time and species evolving out of each other, I mean, there isn't any controversy. I mean, in any sort of learned circles. It's, uh, it's only people who take the Bible literally that... Um, that oppose it, um, and uh, but it's and it's that which I think the state should just simply ignore. Mm. But is that really the same as the case, the Drummondville case? The Drummondville case is about ethics and religion curriculum. So what about that, Martin? I mean, are you are you? I mean, you're using another example here. I understand that. But would you, would you apply that directly to this particular example? Yeah, well, I, I'd be interested to hear from Ian what the state's case was for introducing this course in the first place. Um, What's behind uh, it? Uh, yeah, what, uh, what exactly is behind it? Um, but um, I can imagine a, uh, a claim by the state that it's essential in in a, uh, a multicultural society such as Canada proclaims itself to be, uh, that um, uh, its students learn about uh, the various religious faiths which are represented in that society. Um, now, uh, I, uh, I have a hard time, I mean, in fact, from what you said, I judge that the parents had no objection 
to a course which just simply taught about other religious faiths. Um, uh, so perhaps there's something peculiar about this course yeah. that is the uh, objection, and and, uh, and then of course I just have to see what the what the the character of the course. Yeah, was. that's a good point. Part of the the difficulty in the record, and there was a genuine problem in so far as the. The course, the materials that were put in included the general curriculum framework, the general goals of the curriculum and so on. And there was a certain abstract nature to the specific objections, apart from the fact that they had taken one textbook and showed that it, in their view it led to this drawing together of, of superheroes and divinities. They didn't like that. There was expert evidence on both sides. I don't know why the court didn't say it found the satisfactory evidence to make a decision. They could have if they wanted to, actually. There was expert evidence. There were proven experts. They had the materials on record from people. They disputed each other's viewpoint, not unusual in a litigation. But the court stepped right back from that and said, we don't find enough on the record. Well, that's, uh, that was very strange to me. Um, but no, the, it, on the record, the parents' objections was rooted in their interpretation that the course was humanistic and relativistic against their religious beliefs. And uh, I think it, it is uh, important that there be some reason, some sincerely held of religious objection. I don't think you can just go in and say, I don't want my kid doing this and this and this for no reason. I think you have to ground it in some uh, sincere objection. But beyond that, I think we have to give the benefit of the doubt to parents in this one. The reason for the state's concern was they said this is this flows out of the deconstitutionalizing of religious education in Quebec when they got rid of the Section 93 protected status for denominational education. They saw a vacuum that needed to be filled with respect to ethics and religious culture. They thought the students of Quebec should know where they came from religiously and they were going to teach the course and this was the course. More interestingly, the parents who objected were Catholics some of the expert evidence in favor of the course was a Catholic theologian who didn't see a problem with it. The, controversially, the Catholic bishops in Quebec didn't say much about the course other than that they, quote, had some concerns and were going to be watching the development of the course in coming years. Well, of course, that didn't give much comfort to parents who had children in the school now, not in years down the road. Um, Within the, the church, within the Catholic Church, the rest, the bishops in other parts of Canada who had real concerns about the course felt that silenced by the, the politics of the Quebec bishops. They didn't want to be seen as, you know, dividing the house, which is a problem in many religions. Islam has it all the time. Why they don't want to appear divided, so they don't say anything at all. So um, this is a problem. These political dimensions to the case. But at the end of the day, I think the really hard question is. Can we be sanguine about a situation in which the state power is inflated against the uh, demands of parents, however much we may personally disagree with those parents? And I'm not sanguine about that. I'd rather, at the end of the day, have as many mechanisms to, inf to allow for associational protection, familial protection, as we can get. I think the more of those we get rid of, the, the more dangerous it becomes in, in a free and democratic society. It's striking to me that this issue is a Quebec in Quebec, and enough, that these cases that you talk about have all been in Quebec, yeah. and that what we see in Quebec is a society which was highly centralized under a very particular kind of Catholicism, which reached into everybody's home <laughs> and deeply went into the politics of the society, and then with the Quiet Revolution it becomes the most virulent secular place in the world, but it seems to me continues to adopt the same kind of totalist, totalizing model. It just secularizes it. Thank you, David. Very close, very close to your mouth. Uh, Those of you who can't hear can move forward too, you know, because it's, we can only do as good as we can do with the system. There's a chair here, there's a chair there. There's three chairs at the front. Ian, thank you very much for the presentation. I was thrilled to hear you recite poetry. I was thrilled to hear you recite poetry. Thank you. I want to get back to uh, 
You know, you mentioned, it, you alluded to Islam as how the court was seen in the future a coming battle uh, with this faith. That is very interesting. Uh, I'd like you to expand on that and also say something about the fact that uh, you work in France. And then, therefore, what is the influence of the Enlightenment philosophy on the present court, or the mythology of the Europeans on the present court, versus, say, the Canadian mythology? You know, for instance, uh, John Rolton Saul talks about a different kind of Canada from, say, a European or a United States model. What, it do, what does the court think is coming so that it frames its decisions in a way that will strengthen the present Canadian mythology of a certain kind of country, of a certain kind of religion, which is exclusive of others? Well, yeah, that's a profound question. I mean, I don't, I, I think I, I, I emphasized that the comment about Islam was my own elephant in the room kind of observation. I'm asking myself, why has the court in the Hatterian Brethren decision out of Alberta dealing with driver's licenses, and now the Drummondville parents' decision, these are the last two decisions dealing with religion. Why has it given so much power to the state authorities and not applied its usual nuanced protection in, with respect to proportion, in the proportionality test under the free and democratic society <coughs> screen of the charter analysis? Why has it not accorded more respect to the the smaller groups, the, the Hutterites in the driver's license case, and now the parents in the Drummondville case. Well, I think part of it is a reaction to the furore in Quebec following the Multani decision on the Kirpan. But I think part of it has to be seen as concerns that the, the court not take away from the state its regulatory capacity with respect to religious rights. And I think, that, I think it's Islam, because um, there is a concern about uh, accommodation, which is one of the key uh, concepts in Canada with respect to religion, that accommodation can go too far and either produce a fragmentation of the polis, the kind of communitarian fragment, fragmenting that we don't want to see. So we want to affirm individual rights, but we don't want a fragmented culture. We want some gesture towards um, shared citizenship. And I think the course on ethics and religious culture in Quebec was set up to try and form in a French model, type model, the core conception of the Republic. The interesting thing is, you mentioned France. I do live in France. I commute to Canada and South Africa. But the French experience has shown me the amazing capacity of religious people within the Catholic tradition that I'm a part of um, to accept what to Canadians would be appalling lack of respect for individual religious people. For example, the French Catholics that I know have no problem with the fact that you cannot wear a turban, you, you couldn't wear a système ostensible, you can't wear a cross or any religious symbol in any public employment, meaning that you can't be a magistrate and be an observant Sikh. You can't, you know, you get the point. You can't wear a head covering and be in a government position in the post office or anywhere else. Things that in Canada we've long settled through litigation and through debate and argument. We have turbans in the RCMP, we have no problem with people in post offices wearing their religious garb. Well, that's not the case in France at all. So I think Quebec would like to be France. I really do. I think that what's going on in Quebec is a kind of longing towards the Republic, the Mother Republic. And I think they like that um, laic conception that is very like secularistic, secularism, the kind of a stridently anti-religious cultural movement. However, it's if they think that in Quebec, they have to look a little more at the subtleties of French culture because France is not a culture that's got away from its religion. It's very, very interesting. Not only do they still fund Catholic education in Quebec, in France, they, when a major religious figure in the culture dies, the president is at the funeral and the whole thing's televised not on just one French television station, but likely on two or three of them, as in the case of Abbé Pierre, the founder of the Emmaus communities. I could not think of a comparable Canadian experience. I cannot imagine a, a religious figure in Canada who, if they died, there'd be a national event in Ottawa <coughs> at which the, premier, the Prime Minister would be bound to attend and everybody would watch it. 
so this is not the the thing about the French Republican experience leading to this radical secularism is much more subtle than it might appear on the surface. You know, that's based on living there for eight years only, but you know, it is. I think it's complicated. So I think <coughs> Quebec. Quebec is not going to be able to shake its religious roots. I think David's inter intervention is exactly right. I think the church overreached in Quebec in ways that Dignitatis Humanae, the Second Vatican Council document in 1962, would utterly reject now. Um, I think the result of that Quebec overreach, call it that, has been a swing back in, a, in the not-so-quiet revolution to the kind of secularistic anti-religion you now see in Quebec. And I don't think the Supreme Court's bob and weave in the Drummondville parents' case is going to continue because when they hit the home education cases where that course is forced on parents in their homes, when they're dealing with the Loyola case involving a religious institution like Loyola College, I don't think they're going to be able to do what they did in the Drummondville parents' case. So we're going to have to sooner or later face a much more aggressive conflict between religion and um, secularism in Quebec. I want to uh, continue on that. You know, for instance, if you compare uh, Europe, each country has come about as a result of its ethnicity, mm -hmm. its language, etc. So other people are then outsiders to that. The U.S., for instance, is very much, if you talk to an American, they'll talk about being an American, and they relate first and foremost to the Constitution. In Canada, we have a sort of, you know, sort of both and neither here nor there, which may be good, but where is it going to, for example, in cases uh, about the cases that you are arguing, and let's talk about specific, let's talk about hijab, for instance, you know, which is very much in the forefront. Every time it comes up, the issue of how Muslim women dress seems to be like, you know, a hot button. So, how is it that it doesn't come up in the U.S.? It, it, uh, it, it, to a certain extent, has been resolved in Canada, but not in Quebec. Because even when uh, you know a, a girl wants to wear a, not a complete covering hijab, but just a headdress in a sports, you uh, know, in a, a sports area, there's a problem. Same happens in uh, you know uh, Belgium and uh, France, where they've brought a law. Mm -hmm. And there was a very interesting video uh, which I saw passed around where these two women. I don't know what, you know, they look white, so, you know, apparently one of them was a Muslim, who wore, who were completely covered up to the waist and a little down, wearing mini skirt, but then totally uncovered. You know, their legs, and they wore high heels, and they, stru and they went walking around in the city. And the, and the people, they were completely shocked, you know, and they think, but you can see the shock on their faces because they wanted to have their pictures taken with these two women. So, and they were poking fun. And the fact that these, this government, which is now, an inheritor of the Enlightenment is now deciding who should wear what. You know, that, that was a sort of, you know, poking fun of them. But I mean, you know, the, what I'm trying to get at is the difference between the U.S., the Canadian, and the European response to, you know, what is seen as an outsider. Yeah. And when is it that these outsiders are going to be accepted? Because these people who are, you know, the Europeans in North America have occupied this territory. From the North, from the North American Indian, you know, there's lots of battles going on about that. I'm sure you know more about that than I do. So, how is it all this going to come about? Look, if you pull the lens back on the exclusion of the other, which is really what or inclusion and exclusion of the other, it, it look at any period of history, go way back, <coughs> um, tribalism, them and us, is a basic question. It has theological, philosophical dimensions. It ultimately has a legal dimension. But we're not talking about anything new here. I mean, you have established religion officially in England. You have separation in the U.S., whatever that means. The famous letter's been turned on its head from a protection of religion to an exclusion of religion, which isn't actually. I mean, they, then you have the president setting up a faith office and blah, blah, blah. blah. So <laughs> the, the, in Canada, we have something in the middle. We don't have establishment. We don't have separation. We have what I call cooperation of religions and culture and the society and the state. Um, you have all these different models, but at the end of the day, the model only sets the official template, because what actually works itself out on the ground through litigation and through practical fun is how the people live together. Okay. Now, 
One of the really interesting questions for uh, me is the quid pro quo of acceptance and rejection. I lectured in Riyadh some years ago in Saudi Arabia on medical ethics. And in the course of being there, I was fascinated that the only place you could go as a Christian or a Jew to worship, do you know where the Christians and Jews worship in Riyadh? U.S. Embassy. Now, when I was in a debate in New York City, I wasn't a debater, I was in the audience, there was a guy called Barry Lind, who's the, the chief spokesman for the separate, people united for the separation of church and state, he calls himself the Reverend Barry Lind. He's a very dogmatic, strict separationist. After dinner, being the only Canadian at the table with the donors for the dinner and a few other people and Barry Lind and both the both debaters were there and there was a lull in the conversation and I said to him, you know, as an innocent Canadian, I just asked this question. I said, you know, you're a proponent of strict separation for anything that's public in the U.S. Um, how would you deal with what I ran into in Riyadh? I mean, I guess you'd be really strongly opposed to the Jews and the Christians using the embassy. He had never thought of it. He was like a deer in the headlights. He was, he was his most appalling silence. And what it showed me was this, that all of these doctrines, these official doctrines of separation, of establishment, of cooperation, of uh, diversity and so forth, they ultimately have to work out in terms of living together with disagreement or not. And part of that is to, you cannot judge from the outside the beliefs of others from the inside. You know, you can understand them. They have an ontology, epistemology, they have a whole framework that you don't necessarily accept. This is why the gay marriage debate in Canada was so problematic. We, the, in Canada, we really had radically different conceptions of maleness and femaleness and what it meant in different traditions. And those different traditions had their liberal, one, a more mo contemporary version and a more traditionalist or orthodox, dogmatic, older version. Actually, both are dogmatic. And the court was put in the position of deciding which one of these aspects of these traditions was going to become the, the public norm. Or was it? Or was it really welcoming into the public a group of people who had hitherto been excluded? And didn't, did it then welcome them into the public, or did it give them control of the public? That's the next phase of the litigation. You see what I mean? You had the view, you didn't have same-sex marriage. Then you made the possibility of same-sex marriage. Now you get people within the same-sex activist community arguing for an exclusive viewpoint, similar to uh, the previous dominant viewpoint that controlled the sphere. So then you start typing the other viewpoint as heterosexist or homophobic, and then you want to rule it out in the same way as that viewpoint was originally ruled out by the previous occupiers of the space. So, what you really get, whether it's abortion, whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it's any number of debates, you ha it's a sort of a contest over who's going to have the discourse in the public sphere. And the law ends up being a set of arguments about the principles of space sharing between competing belief systems. It's really what law has to be. And the question then is, how can you make a better description of the eventual outcome than the other person? How can you make the most, and that's the rhetoric of law, I think. But the problem is, all of the preset framework theories, the French Republic, American separation, establishment in the U.S., the European laicism in, in France, they actually don't work out on the ground the way they're officially described. And in Canada right now, we have a fascinating project funded in part by His um, Highness the Aga Khan and the Canadian government called the Global Center for Pluralism. I'm on the board of that. And it has a long-term mandate and a very large endowment to work out what are the principles of pluralism. The Aga Khan came to Canada because he thought Canada had, better than any country, embodied the a kind of functional pluralism. And now we've got, it's up to us to try and, for a long, long time, you know, this long-term project, to try and actually spell out competing views of pluralism and so on. We have an event coming up where we're bringing some of the better thinkers of the day to talk about multiculturalism. But... I think Canada is an amazing place for this, but I think we have to identify the risk of civic total totalism, the idea of one viewpoint, and this is why this parent's case is so important, and we have to identify the, the places of respect, accommodation, and dissent much better than we're doing. We're far too sanguine about homogeneity on the public viewpoints from the state.
I think. Close to you. Yeah. Very close to you. We want to yes. hear every yeah. word. Uh, I have a. Uh, I am. You are assuming, and, and I think that's uh, you can confirm it or not, that the state gets his uh, educational mandate from the parents. Uh, in fact, a teacher used to be in loco parentis, right? Uh, I would like to question that basic assumption. Uh, it's a leftover from older time where the, the father owned all the member of the family to some extent. Uh, what gives, from your point of view, the parents the right to educate in whatever way they want the children, when really the children are the future member of society and shouldn't be left to the responsibility of a parent. I can see abuses on both ends, but I, I would like to see <coughs> why is the state considered a bad uh, local parentis, if you want, or even better, why isn't the state the official uh, teacher and the parents take a secondary role, if you want. <laughs> oh, I love it. No, <laughs> that's great. Uh, I mean, yes, I think you're making a valid point that there's a tension. Okay? Yeah. The state has its interest, the family has its interest, the parents have interest. Yes, the family notion of the family, what it meant, has changed historically. But I'd, I'd say I mean, there's one book I read that had a huge influence on me years ago. It's by Igor Shafarovich, called The Socialist Phenomenon, published in 1980 by Harper Rowe, introduction by Solzhenitsyn. And in it, what Igor Shafarovich deals with is the history of what he calls Kailiastic Socialism, from ancient Babylon through, and he deals with the Jesuits in Paraguay, and he deals with Anabaptism and Anabaptists and all kinds of interesting groups. But he ends up showing that the, the view of what he calls Kailastic Socialism ended up attacking three things. One, the role of religion in the culture. Two, the role of the family. And three, the institution of private property. And that whenever it got um, installed, it tended to work tremendous hardship on people because it gave too much power to the state authority and attack those three, three things, three institutions. Now, that's a useful thing for a lawyer to read because in Section 1 of the Constitution in Canada, we have to breathe all of our constitu constitutional analysis through the principles of a free and democratic society. So you're always asked reasonable limits in a free and democratic society. So it imports the notion of reasonability, the notion of freedom and democracy. So the question is, in this discussion about parents and the state, what, is, what it, does freedom and democracy add to the analysis of the tension between the state and the parents? If Shafarovich is right, and he's the historian, I'm not, although he's actually a mathematician until he lost his job at Moscow for writing this book, <laughs> for writing this book, um, an extraordinary book. But if he's right, and this, his, this, this history of, of uh, show, history shows this kind of problem developing when we give power, too much power to the state, then, then in fact what you do have is a risk to free, human freedom by giving too much power to the state. And I think it doesn't require a lot of thinking in a post-Soviet context to see what can happen when you give uh, untrammeled power to the state, no place for parental dissent against state norms. So I'm with the parents, I'm with the associations, the subsidium, I'm with dissent. I think dissent matters. It's essential to freedom, and it's probably critical to democracy. Your concern, though, if I understand correctly, is that you don't want parents pushing back against the government's control of Keystone let me, Pipeline, let me right? Make my point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, you assume that oh, yeah. parents and uh, are the primary, which I said, you know, yeah, yeah, I didn't deal with that. The second is that you're assuming a conflict between the society at large, i.e. government, and the individual. Whereas I see the individual as a member of that society, 
So within that society, you can disagree, <coughs> argue, jump up and down, do whatever he wants, right? Within certain boundaries. And those boundaries are, I don't own those kids. Yeah. I have brought into the world, and the only connection I have to have is genetic and sentimental, which are not the basis for a good fundamental <laughs> relation to society. Yes. Okay. I, can I can tell you didn't come from a family which read Christmas Carol every Christmas. Uh, you know, I mean, the Vic this Victorian notion of the, the family gathered around uh, Tiny Tim and, and all of us, you know, learning from that experience, that's very warm and close to the heart of uh, I came, my tradition. I came from an Italian tradition mm. where on Christmas Day you stood up on a chair when you were that little and you read a poem to your father as a representative of the, I don't know what they have. No, of the, of the state, of the state. It was Garibaldi was uh, speaking through your father. But in fact, no. I mean, the thing is, freedom... Sorry, no slide on Garibaldi. But the thing is, the, the, the fact of the matter is, this your, the tension you're describing, I, I would be terrified of a situation in which we saw ourselves first as... Um, Citizen. Yeah. And second, as members of our associations of belief and kinship. See, you have because to, it seems to me through history... You have to give up tribalism, which is no. the family's tribe. No, the state becomes the tribe then. Uh, it's That's all that right happens. Historically, all that happens the is you have bigger tribes, better. bigger wars. The bigger the better. You can't avoid tribalism. No, it isn't. The bigger the better. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Do you read Huxley at all? Orwell? I mean, these guys, the, the, these people saw the problem that if you treat human beings as members of a factory farm, yeah. you know, you, you're going to get people treated as widgets, as dispensable things, uh, not indispensable things. And I think, I think this view of human beings as products of a factory farm, the state having the prior right to decide who's in hatchery number one and who's in hatchery number three, to use Huxley's um, vision, um, I think that's a nightmare. It's a koshmar, and the reason it's a koshmar is because uh, it, it leads us to this de it leads to dehumanization. There is something about localization, about the family and community, that preserves us from the unanimous imprint of the over all powerful state. I think, Ian, that you fail to understand our good colleague here, who has lived in Alberta for quite a long time, and our governments in Alberta. You know, we just don't view them the way you view the government in France <laughs> or, or in Ontario. Our governments in Alberta oh, are, oh, no, are, so, are deeply part of the same family and have been really since Bible Bill Eberhardt. We have to take a break. I'll give you a chance to respond to that. We have to take a break for uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, you can recharge your, your tea and uh, talk together, and then we'll return to the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Justify. We'll begin the second half with a um, by referring to a question that was just asked that he was part of listening to from someone who's just had to leave. So I'll do the best to. And David, you can correct if I miss anything. But she's a law uh, law student and asked the question. She'd been studying the polygamy cases uh, and most recently the one out of British Columbia and asked the question. Um, had I thought about the fact that equality is often in Canadian constitutional cases pitted against religion. It's viewed as an equality versus religion question. And that was certainly something that came up in the same-sex marriage litigation as well. The equality of certain people is is said to be the claim, is, forms the claim and it's against religion. And therefore, thereby what they seek to do is elevate the case into one that's uh, focused essentially on furthering equality rights versus those who are trying to defend an established entrenched right. Now, in the cases on same-sex marriage and since, uh, several of us have written and argued in cases against that view, arguing that in fact, Equality is one of the enumerated rights in the non-discrimination clause of our charter in section 15. Um, sorry, religion is. 
Therefore, religion is itself an equality right. So it's wrong to take one aspect of equality, like, same, like sexual orientation, and say this is the equality claim against religion. And it's done all the time. And it's not just done in Canada, it's being done increasingly in South Africa, um, where equality is seen as against religion. Now, I thought I'd just throw that out. Uh, David, is that your intention, that we just raise that as a starting point for conversation? Because... I think it, I'd be interested in any viewpoints here as to why, A, why, why that is, because it's clearly the case that that's how things are being argued. And what's, why is it, do you think it's being argued that way? And what's wrong with it to argue that certain claims are, constitute the equality interest and the other claim is simply a religious interest when religion is itself an equality right within the Charter? Does anyone have any? Um, well, one thought that comes to me immediately is equality is not, in my mind, against religion. At least I want to say properly understood, I believe that religion, authentic spiritual religion, had believes in the equality of all because it assigns all people to a common origin, an origin in, in, the, in the divine. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm resisting this uh, blanket assertion that, the, that uh, equality and religion are opposed to each other. And I mean, I, I'm committed deeply to the uh, equality of heterosexual and homosexual. Race, people yeah. Uh, to me, that the, the equality is an the equality, the equality <coughs> in the realm of uh, gender and sexuality is a, a basic uh, component of my understanding of uh, religion, Christian religion, and or any. Any other views on equality in religion? Why it is that at this point in uh, our jurisprudence that seems to be the common construction, that there's an antagonism between the two. Another similar antagonism that's often expressed is that religion and human rights are in conflict. And that seems to me to be a parallel misconstruction, and yet it's extremely common. It, it's, got a, it's clearly got a rhetorical reason that it's somehow if you can claim the rich rhetoric of human rights as your, uh, you know, claim that as the mantle, then you have a better chance of succeeding. But I find it quite fascinating that those two parallel constructions are so powerful in the court cases and human rights cases at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure I can comment directly on that. <coughs> a bit of an allusion to something else, and I commented at the outset I'm a recovering lawyer, so much of what you said resonates with me. Um, you've written eloquently in other places about the problem of secular, and the problem of kind of a, a mono version of secularism. And you've also spoken about the need for the public space, in effect, to be a place where Faiths are reconciled by all who participate in the public space. So I'm wondering, without conflating the law and justice, but looking to some of the observations you made about this most recent case, how does the court begin to reconcile faith in the context of accommodation without inquiring into the theology? Uh, and I would say that that may be part of the reason uh, for the conundrum around the least injured parties in the Charter between the different heads. From my own view, the question is, within the heads, how do you reconcile different claims uh, arising? So, for me, whether it's technique or, or telos, somebody has to speak to what language the court can use to begin to not just intervene but supervise uh, that contest of faith.
Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't have much to say to that. You put it very eloquently. Uh, the one thing to think about, I think the court could have got out of this doing justice to the interests involved much better than it did by, for example, saying some positive things about civics programs. I would like to have had the court say more about why those programs matter to citizenship. And it's, they didn't actually say anything like that. So they should have, A, affirmed the importance of commonality within citizenship, which they didn't do. Then they should have affirmed the importance of dissent from civic totalism, which they didn't do. And at the end of that, had they done that, I think they would have affirmed the principled conflict in a way that actually was helpful to citizens in the future in framing the debate about curriculum. They didn't do either of the two pillars. They should have set them up and then said what they said, <coughs> that here we can't determine the conflict because there's insufficient evidence, a point I strongly disagree with on the basis of my understanding of the record. But leave that. I don't think they did justice to the role that they have in giving citizens and the whole society clarity about what the debate was. I don't really think they did that. And that's parallel to the whole problem I tried to speak to about their failure to give a robust description of the role that religion plays culturally. For some reason in Canada, we are terrified of saying really positive things about community, first of all. You know, our rights really have impoverished political discourse in a highly individualistic way, the way Marianne Glendon has said, uh, is seen very strongly across the border in the U.S., but we have it here as well. We have a court that's running away from affirming the place of religion, the importance of community, all of these things. And the, I think in that case, you, I think you put the point very well. Well, and I, I would simply say that part of it is, is the lawyers and the academics are somewhat to blame in that we're not providing a discourse, a language of discourse, that allows the bench to reconcile communitarian and individual interests uh, in a way that some of the earlier cases did, but have been completely abandoned. And the only place that I see that being attempted is in Aboriginal claims. Uh, but that tension is quickly being lost uh, to individual rights folks. I think Anna had a point. Yeah, I think I'm going to go for it after all. This is to, this is to the um, religion and equality. Uh, question and the dichotomy between them that's being set up. And I think while I agree with everything else you have said and what you have said about the cases, the law cases, I think that question sets up religion as an organ, if we're thinking like biologically in the body. It's like you can take out the gallbladder or you can take out the appendix. And um, it isn't like that. Religion is is socially and economically determined by the surrounding culture and worshipping within a patriarchal religion myself and one that has, has been patriarchal from the world go and from its antecedents and that's the Judeo-Christian tradition. Equality is tidy in lots of ways. You can set it up as if it were a gallbladder or an appendix. I mean it spreads but you can give a fairly straightforward definition. Religion isn't just a part of somebody's life, though. It pervades in lots of ways. And individuals within it can, can make decisions and, and decide, as Ray did, that really we are all equal in our origin from the divine. But that's not the way people within the religious traditions necessarily live. That's, that's, that's an idealism and it's an abstraction. And perhaps that's the other part of my summation, really. Equality is an abstraction. And religion just isn't when you get to the particular. That's really interesting. That's very, very helpful. Because one of the things that um, we've been dealing with in law and religion recently has been cases in which um, employment relationships have been analyzed in terms of the employer's religious rules. And you get an employee who changes their view on a contract they may have signed to live according to their religion. And when these things go to the human rights tribunals in the first instance, 
some there's two lines of jurisprudence that can be followed. The, the one that's been gaining ground and worries me immensely is to parse the job functions within the religious organization to see whether this person, and you, you can see how this ties in with your point, whether this particular person's function within the organization is a religious function or not. Now, if you step back from religions and view them as associational projects, they're obviously not all the same. In some, the religion is really at the top. You know, there's a core group who are the religious people, and the work they do isn't particularly religious. There are others in which they meet together for Bible studies, they pray together as employees with managers and, and workers on the line. They, they have a different kind of ethos than the other organization. But to treat them all the same, and from the outside say, we're going to determine which are the religious positions, and then accord those protection under the special employer exemptions that human rights typically have. That strikes me as a very reductive, particularly reductionist conception of religion. It's, it, uh, it avoids this idea of a permeated ethos in which to ask what kind of job this is, is to misunderstand the nature of the religious project. So, you know, I report that just as a graphic example of your, in a sense, I mean, to use the example, if it can be used in a positive way, you're talking about the distinction between an encapsulated and an integrated tumor, right? Encapsulated tumors can just be removed and we continue, but it, one that's where it's permeated, where there's metastases that's occurred, you can't do that. So, in real, and I think your point's very well made, that, that to view equality in the encapsulated sense, culturally, is just simply inappropriate, and from a religious sense, incomprehensible. I think that's very powerful. It's helpful. Um, Ian, uh, uh, could we go back to the discussion that you had an answer to the question I asked you? Sorry. Mm -hmm. I've actually been thinking a lot about several of the things you said. Oh, good. And it's difficult, at least not knowing what the kinds of cases, the kinds of issues that were involved, but um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is your suggestion that religion or and specific, uh, specific confessions were presented in a vulgar or trivializing, mindless way. And I have to say, as a, as a philosopher, that really gets my interest, because I'd like to see it made a criminal offense, maybe punishable by flogging for people uh, deliberately to misrepresent other points of view. That, that seems to have become quite common, and it really gets up my nose. So with that in mind... Well, why don't you say, say what you really think? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Capital flogging. Flogging. Yeah, that was fun. Um, in school. <laughs> Part of the difficulty with pulling kids out of a curriculum is the, that it looks as if it might be an effort to prevent the kids having exposure to other things to which, uh, as members of the community, we think they need to know about. Part of the difficulty with it is that, in any event, it, it does limit their exposure to those things. So I'd like to put a, a kind of hypothetical to you. Let's suppose that we got that, that there was a course that got rid of the mighty mouse trivialization of this, but really did make an effort to present what it was like to be a member of <coughs> and then taking in order a, a number, perhaps four, perhaps half a dozen uh, major religions, but where 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 the kids were exposed to this not primarily in terms of the theology or the catechisms of the, of the religions, but more in terms of those religions as they were practiced in Canada as, as sub-ethos. In other words, what it's like to grow up Sikh, or what it's like to grow up Jewish, with a view just to acquainting kids with those aspects of the community. There would then still uh, perhaps be objections that members of various faith communities might have to the presentation of their own faith communities. And you'd want administratively to try to minimize that. But at the end of it, I could see 
allowing members of faith communities to pull their kids out of the sections that taught their own religions on the grounds, perhaps, that they were going to get a just a terrible misrepresentation of what it meant to be Sikh. But where would you be on requiring the kids to, to take a course like that that did expose them in a good faith way to the some panoply of the deep spiritual outlooks in the community? Well, I mean, it is literally the case here that the devil's in the details, you know. Um, it, it may well be this. Um, no matter how sensitive provincial education authorities are to the creation of a curriculum, of a curriculum that they think is in the interests of everybody, there are going to be those who, for reasons we can't fathom, are going to be against it. Particularly when we're dealing with religions and their portrayal and their content. Because even within religions, you know, any religion, there are dissentient groups. There are those within the religion itself who take the contrary position and don't want the other position said to be their position, right? So, then what do you do when you're faced with that objection? And I think that's where you, the, you have to deal with this question of dissent and exemption and opt-outs and so on. And, and my point today with respect to this has been quite simple but fairly robust. And that is that, that kind of, here's where Martin makes some excellent points. But, and it's the, you know, every position has its difficult points in ethics and moral conversations. You're never going to avoid problems where you're, points where there's no problem. So I'll admit, my problem is, I want to, when there's a doubt about how to weigh the equities in the state versus parents, I want to place the counter, the extra counter, on the parents for reasons that are outside the debate. So they're, they're outside of what subject matter we're talking about. They're to do with the structure of parental authority versus the state authority. And your points are well taken. Things are changing in the family. And parents are not as connected and they're not as ed perhaps as educated. They're not what we may wish. Do we want to make parenthood a licensed function like driver's licenses? I don't. But, you know, the logic of stupid parents is that they have to learn how to do it better and maybe the state has a role in encouraging parents. Well, we used to call that civics and education. How do we teach the young about morals, how they should live? Well, we don't teach about morals anymore. We're afraid of it. We've become um, morally phobic culturally. So, you know, Canada's got its settings to full drift ahead and we just, the ship of states just going where it goes and we're just hopeful that we can do something about it. And here's something about it, a course on civics. Isn't that great? Well, I can imagine courses on civics that would be great, that are done with great sensitivity to the different groups within the culture, that maybe have the section on Judaism done by the chief rabbi and leading Jews, the section on Christianity done by leading Catholics and Protestants together, where the course materials are actually formulated by the group in the community that want, are going to be portrayed. I think that would be a positive thing minimizing the possibility of massive dissent. But at the end of the day, when that course, put together no matter how sensitively, is presented, is there still a residual right in the citizenry to object to it? I think the answer should be yes, for reasons outside of the course, but to do with the interplay in, of governance, if you want to call it that, between the state and the citizenry. I think we have to build in places of dissent. And that was my argument to the Supreme Court of Canada, and I lost, you know. But I, I, I think it's the best argument. So, so just, see, I, I thought what I was proposing, this is a very quick supplement, I thought what I was proposing was precisely a civics course. It's about the community. It's not about truth. I mean, not, I'm, not, I'm not a relativist on these things, but it's, what you're trying to do is to teach kids about the kind of community in which they live so they can encounter one another at a more fundamental level than I think they're able to now. Yeah, exactly. That said, though, just with, would I be correct in... I want to chase you down a little bit. Because it seems to me we, we differ on that residual right, but that's not the argument. 
That residual right, however, is a right of family determination. It's not a right of religion, right? I mean, you might have to talk about religion to get it before the courts. But since if we're talking about justice, not law, then it's a question of the rights of families in relation to their kids. It's not protected by any religious right. Am I right there? Well, it's actually, you can put it more fun foundationally, it's actually prior to law, right? There's no law guaranteeing it as such. Yeah, but, but if the question is whether do we put it on this blackboard or on that blackboard, mm -hmm. And I'm saying, I think you're putting it on a blackboard that has family on it, not a blackboard that has religion on it. Yeah. Uh, what's the purpose of the distinction? Um, clarity, truth. I mean, those things that I no, like. No, 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 I think it's important. <laughs> well, no, we're talking, isn't, we're talking. isn't this precisely an overlap here? I mean, if you're talking about... See, the, the, in, the, in certain religious traditions, the family is understood as a natural organ. Yeah. Okay? It's, it's, and by natural, they don't mean understood as natural by law. They mean natural in terms of the idea of society being a part of the natural order. So it's seen as a sacramental reality. The family right. is, that's how they would understand it. That's how who would understand? No, how they would understand it. Some so, people. so you're just, you're, the reason I asked for the reason for your distinction between family or state, right? The two blackboards. So and what I'm saying, is family or religion, religion. But is that those you, are? I think that's an artificial. I think that distinction itself needs to be pushed. It is, of course, an artificial distinction for people whom you are representing, but it's not a Paul artificial for people like me. Right, because you well, may have a family that doesn't see itself. And what I, want to hold, I, guess, I get that. What I want to hold out for is a broad principle that in matters of education, if children are <coughs> genuinely educated by something, and unless there's a case of harm, and if we build in a protective right of exemption in the case of your own profession, then what we're talking about here has nothing to do with protection of religion. And the case has to be based, as you would put it, and I would oppose it, on, a, on, a, on the right of families to control what stuff their children are exposed to in schools. And I want, see, I want to put it that way because I want to shape the, the issue once it's shaped in that way is, I think once you cover the three issues that I gave you at the start of that, you don't have anything left, and you don't have much of a case with which to persuade anyone who doesn't already agree with you. There's not, there's not a religious case anymore. There's a family case, and you're going to no. go back to Mark. No, what if my objection isn't my community, but the portrayal of other communities? What if my objection isn't the way you portray Christianity, but the way you portray religions generally, right? Then I may want to take the position that the state as I understand the role of the state, shouldn't be teaching about religions. That, now, now here's, here's where uh, I'm actually you in fit. You may do or you are doing. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to argue where it's... All I want is to get the position clarified. And when yeah. you say you might want to do it, then I don't know where to go with it. No, you see, you, you've, got, you've tried to create an exemption here yes. that you think will satisfy everybody if they're exempted from their own tradition's portrayal. And I'm saying in the response, that's insufficient because my objection might not be the portrayal of my community, but the, objection, the portrayal of other communities. I may not like what you're saying about Islam, for example, as a Christian. I may not like what you're saying about Judaism as a Christian. I want my kids not to be exposed to that view of Islam or Judaism. Okay? Why not? And that because because of my, I don't know, any number of reasons. <laughs> but, but here's the, there's a bigger question here. That before the Supreme Court of Canada, before the Supreme Court of Canada, I argued that there is a place for civics courses, right? And there may be a case for requiring parents to meet state goals. But the key thing isn't the end, it's the means. How, what's the, how are they going to get there? The state can set up a test saying, we want all citizens in Quebec or in Ontario or in Alberta to be educated to know what Hinduism is, uh, what, what Islam is, what Christianity's tenets are, what all the tenets are of the great faiths. We want this. We want them to know about agnosticism and atheism. What is agnosticism in a, as a general panoply of things? What is atheism as a general panoply of things? I think that's great. Okay. However, 
the parents may not like the way the state has structured that, but the state may have a right to say, we think everybody should know the basics about these categories. So it's about how you get to the state's end. The state's interest can't be in telling you this is what you have to believe about them. It can only be this is the content of them. That's the distinction between teaching religion and teaching about religion. So I would like home educators, for example, across the board to be told that their children, I don't want citizen silos, right? Where everybody's in their own little silo, ignoring the reality of the community around them. But I want to get there very carefully. And one of the ways I think we need to be careful in getting there is A, to allow opt-out and exemption, but B, to provide the correct way of state review on content. And I think Quebec blew it because they, they, they claimed, successfully as it turns out, control over the means for now till harm is proven in a subsequent case. But I think the key is not means, it's ends. And that what the state can examine on <coughs> is the, whether the children in home education across a panoply of methods of presentation um, can at the end of the day pass a test as Jewish children showing that they understand what Islam teaches as Islamic parents teach, showing that the kids understand what Christianity is like historically, it's major divisions. Like teaching what atheists te believe or don't believe, what agnostics believe and don't believe. Yeah, I think if we did that as a core general content framework for civics, I think we'd be further ahead than what we have now with full drift. But I think we're reaching it through different ways, and I'm suggesting a way that at the end of the day I think is more accords with freedom, citizen dissent, the role of the family versus the state, and so on. And that's not what's being proposed by anyone at the moment, as far as I can see it. So we have neither civics. We, just, we don't have the kind of... And this is an old debate in Canada. Hilda Neatby, some of you may know that name here in this room, but most people under about 65 or 70... <laughs> Wouldn't have heard of her. I only know her through the fabulous advice of David <coughs> Cayley, who's a good friend of mine from CBC Ideas. Cayley said, oh, you've got to look at Hilda Neatby's book, So Little for the Mind, a critique of Canadian education. You know, Cop Clark, 1950-something, <laughs> 62. Amazing book. I mean, she was so far ahead. Of, she's saying, she's a classicist. She's writing from Saskatchewan. And she's doing this just gloves off critique of Canadian public education saying there's so little for the mind in this. We're depriving children of the tools they need for thought, for moral understanding, etc., etc., etc. Later you have Emberley writing Bankrupt Education, and you have this whole English tradition from, you know, Martin Darcy, C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man. You go back to Newman, you've got a whole Western critique of this kind of collapse of the foundations of thought and education. And now we're living in the midst of trying to figure out how we can patch it up through a debate about civics content. It's a real mess. It really is. You know, we need to have a civics content, but I'm urging get there through respect for the structure of civic associations and, and the role of the family. I don't think we, should, we can avoid that, or we should avoid it. The thing, the thing that uh, I'm struggling with is if you, if you think of it in terms of justice, you look at the course and you'd say, does this course do more good or more harm? And you could decide, you know, whether this course should proceed or not. And, you know, you, uh, you, you proposed a course that sounded very good. But the problem is that, to me, the, the legal system is an extremely blunt instrument in terms of weighing that out. So are we going to say that, okay, this one course is pushed through, based on this book, like how long did it take to get that decision made? What if they change the textbook? Or how it's taught? Or, and so, I, I come down on your side saying that, that we, we can't weigh it effectively on an ongoing basis, so we need to provide um, air on the side of uh, letting the parents decide, because if it turned out that it was a very harmful, um, if it turned out it was a very harmful course, how long is it going to take before you can actually remove them from the course, or that you can change the course? If the state starts promoting something that, that we don't agree with, and so 
it just seems a very blunt instrument without the exemption. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think one of the real hardships, I and mean, one of the things I didn't mention about the case is, not only did it take years and years of litigation, but the court awarded costs against the parents. Now, you had the Quebec government in court. You had, I think, the second largest number of interveners they'd ever granted on a case. Big litigation. And you award costs against the parents? Ah, something about that I just thought was wayward. And it'll come out in the academic, I'm sure someone's going to pick that up in the academic commentary, that this is inappropriate. But that your point's very well made. <coughs> it's taken years of litigation over a curriculum that was in early stages of formation, in which you've said to the parents, I made this point earlier, but it's worth coming back to it, in which the parents are said, prove harm. And you're saying, well, we think there's harm, and we have to now show our kids have been damaged by this course? Well, you're going to use my kid as a guinea pig for damage? What's that all about? You like it. Yeah, I think it's weird. It is very, very weird that, that in an education case where, where religious damage is the, the claim, you have to prove damage. That's very strange. I, I find that very, very weird. Did they uh, distinguish at any point what sort of damage they were anticipating? No, they said you have to show harm. Harm is the term they used. Yeah, now, but now, from now the parent, parental no, standpoint. Oh, what, what were the parents um, anticipating was going to be the harm generated? Oh, they talked. Well, what were the parents anticipating would be the harm? Well, they talked about, they didn't use this language for it because it had been rejected by the court in an <coughs> earlier decision in British Columbia called Chamberlain, where the claim was if you expose our kids to these kind of materials in the classroom, they're going to be confused about what we're teaching them at home. That's the cognitive dissonance argument, and the court rejected it in Chamberlain. So the parents didn't make it as such, but they did talk about the fact that, uh, in fact, it's a very interesting case because the parents, the mother in this case, made a distinction between her children and determined that the older one was capable of dealing with the course because the older child had different capacities than the younger child. The younger child, she said, would be very confused by these materials because this kid doesn't have the same capacity for nuanced distinction that the older one has. And that's exactly the language she used, very smart woman. And the court basically just ignored all of that distinction, nuance from the parents, just threw it to one side. And I thought it placed an extremely high hurdle now on parents. They have to show more than that they think this is going to confuse the kid about their own religion. So what kind of harm? Goodness knows, they don't say really, but they, they just said that it wasn't sufficient what was before them. Throwing it back to more litigation. But I'm really hopeful Loyola will deal with that. And the point you made in the middle about the litigation process not being ideally set up for this, that is so true. Charles Taylor, in a little book he did, I don't know if it was his Massey's, it might have been, called The Malaise of Modern <coughs> Modernity, has a wonderful critique of litigation and its disastrous effects as the means of effect, uh, forming social outcomes. He says, it's simply not set up to build consensus. It's set up for winners and losers, and that's true. It's really not the way to deal with this stuff, but we've got ourselves. I mean, for a while in Canada, we had this court challenges program. It was a disaster, in my <laughs> view, because it channeled into litigation things that really d should have been done through the, through the give and take of... of De democratic debate. And of course there's critiques on the other side, but the democratic debate wasn't dealing with certain issues, so you have to go to the judiciary. Well, maybe, but I think if we encourage litigation as the means of avoiding political debate, politicians love it. They're happy for something to go to the courts, then they don't have to take uh, any heat in the civic chambers, but that's wrong. I think we need to get the jurisdiction of law cut back, pruned back, not extended infinitely, which is what's happening now. You raised, in your opening comment, you talked about sort of ethics versus the legal or ethics versus the legal system. And I was just wondering if you could comment at what point does it enter? When you get to the Supreme Court, um, is the concept of right and wrong come in? My, my exposure. Um, in three or four different legal situations, I found that the legal system never was almost devoid of. Um, it, it's almost trained out to ask the question of right or wrong. It's just strictly 
uh, is it legal or not legal? And so in, in the practice, my exposure to the practice has been it's, it's been the most amoral, not necessarily immoral, but the question of uh, right wrong is is staunchly avoided. Yeah. Well. I mean, that's a th fathomlessly deep question that we could discuss for weeks. You know, the whole courses are taught on precisely this kind of question. But, but in a nutshell, if, you want to, if you're interested in this, there's a decision to read called La Bay um, a few years ago, Supreme Court of Canada, dealing with, it's called the, colloquially the Montreal Swingers case. And it dealt with the, whether the, there should be a swinger, whether a swingers club and the restriction on a swingers club, a sex club, under the criminal code was sustainable under the charter or not. And the court ruled that the criminal code restriction was was no longer appropriate and applied a Millsy and Harms test analysis. So in many ways we've moved to a kind of empirically framed jurisprudence. You show me the harm. You know, I'm not gonna accept notions of contra bonus mores and you know, it's against public morals and those kind of things, which the criminal code is understood, always has been understood, has been in some respects rough and readily a moral system. You can't avoid that. We're telling people what they can do and not do. It's morals. Um, how you sustain moral analysis at a time like ours in this period in history is a whole other question. And it's increasingly <coughs> difficult, I think, to, to do it other than a kind of Bentham or Millsian harm basis. The court resiles from moral determinations, except that inevitably, by virtue of what it's doing, it ends up, right? I mean, it ends up functioning morally. Um, so it's in this dilemma of wanting to avoid moral articulation, but inevitably implying it. Um, they'll say that in one case, it's not the court's rule to get into met metaphysics or morals. They said that in, the, in one of their decisions out of uh, Quebec. And in another case, quoting Mill or Aristotle, and so in some in some ways, it's every any port in a storm, you know, and uh, that's just where we are. And it's it's what's the result, isn't it? I mean, George Grant, who had sometimes a kind of dark-edged vision of things, I admit, but Grant once uh, talked in his book English Speaking Justice about the kind of difficulties of the period in history that we're in. Uh, he talked about the terrifying darkness that's fallen upon contemporary judgment. I don't think I go there quite with him, but maybe that's because he was an Anglican, I don't know. But, but the thing is, uh, you, you should read Le Bay, for sure, and then read um, Dagenet, read Le Bay, and then read Grant's English Speaking Justice. It's a fascinating juxtaposition. There. We have one more, uh, one more comment, and uh, we're close from that. And then we'll have to uh, wind this up. Picking up from this gentleman's observation about exemption, and going back to the kind of earlier part of the conversation about, as you anticipated or suggested, the courts may be concerned about future grappling with exemption and, and the space that that creates. I, I wonder if you could comment on this debate was a, one very much alive in the conscientious objector cases, uh, going back to the First World War in both England and Canada and the United States, where part of the trouble that the court grappled with was the exemption turning into an immunity and the absence of a civic obligation in the face of an exemption. And I, my own sense is the court fear the immunity, and part of what they're grappling with is the absence of a language that they can say, you can have this, but in its place you're responsible for that. Could you just briefly comment on that? Well, no, you, you obviously know more about that area than I do, but there's a paper I heard recently by Barry Bussey, who's the new director of the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. He's doing his doctoral work right now on conscientious objection in Canada. And it was a fascinating paper. It's, it'll be available through the Ontario Human Rights Commission, who's doing their, a review of their creed document at the moment. So I think between you and Barry Bussey, there'd be a robust conversation that I can only watch from the sidelines. We'll have to wait for that conversation, I guess. Thanks so much, Ian. Appreciate it.